All right, Genesis 49. We're going to look at just this is kind of a part one of a part two, a two message. We'll finish next week. But uh, Jacob is going to bless his sons. Uh, he's 147 years old, uh, comes to Egypt at 130. He's had 17 years of uh, probably some of the uh, better years of his life in terms of peace and tranquility and being able to be there. And we've already read about how God blessed them and prospered them there in the land of Goshen in the, uh, Delta, Dial, uh, the, the Delta Nile, uh, and uh, how it was such a great area for them, being able to see Joseph again and so forth. Uh, last week, we looked at the fact that, that uh, he brings uh, Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, in and blesses them. I went through that passage, and it becomes very obvious by the time we hit the end of chapter 49 is that he knew that he was going to die, and he knew that he was going to die very soon. I don't think he got any lab report. I think either it was just a physical condition or maybe God let him know. And so he's going to take these last moments of his life to say something to uh, his sons, which was the kind of the typical patriarchal thing to do. I don't know if these guys were expecting anything good from their father because of all of the grief uh, that uh, they had caused him uh, over, over their lifetime. But what they were probably expecting is for him to make some prediction, some prophecy, something about their life in the future, because that was also part of this, uh, this whole blessing. Uh, now, we only know it's a blessing because in the last verse, uh, uh, one of the last verses of the chapter, in verse 28, it says, All these are the twelve tribes of Israel, and this is what their father spoke to them, and he blessed them. He blessed each one according to his own blessing. But as we go through it... <laughs> Uh, it sounds more like a cursing than a, than a blessing as he kind of uh, deals with the issues and the sin of their life, the grief he's caused them. But in doing so, God uses it to speak to us in our day because it's all directed as a prophecy, as we'll see in the latter days. So uh, they're probably going to be expecting him to say something prophetically. Uh, little did they know the impact his words would uh, would have. Um, uh, again, uh, amazing time of what uh, Jacob has to say to us uh, this morning. It's considered the longest poem in Genesis and at times some of the harshest words. And it does focus on Judah. We'll spend most of our time talking about him and on Joseph. And we'll spend most of our time next week uh, looking uh, at that. Let's take a look at the first two verses. Jacob's last words we're saying are prophetic. And we see that in verse 1. And Jacob called his sons and said, gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. We're going to make a, a big deal out of that phrase. Gather together and hear you sons of Jacob and listen to Israel, your father. So the first thing about these prophetic words is they are, quote, in the last days. And that, and that is a particular phrase. And it describes a time in, uh, in history that begins basically with the church. The last days begin with the ascension of Jesus Christ after his, uh, his death and resurrection uh, and then the outpouring of God's Spirit there in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. And when asked, what is this all about? Peter gets up and preaches his uh, first sermon there and says, this was spoken of by the prophet Joel, which is a prophecy about the last days. So we talk about, we just had end times outreach and we use this phrase, the last days. And it's speaking about the time from the time of the beginning of the church to the time of the end of the tribulation, that last seven-year period. And at the end of that seven-year period of great tribulation, also known as the time of Jacob's trouble, where a world ruler will rise and dominate the world scene. And there'll be seven years of horrific events described by John uh, in the, the book of Revelation. Revelation 19, Jesus Christ uh, returns to planet earth that's the last days that's why we say we think we're in the last of the last days but it's a particular phrase so and we've tried to point this out in our studies on wednesday nights going through the prophets is that when we find that phrase and it's going to happen in the last days it's like okay they just whatever they're saying just jumps completely into the future now for jacob we could read through this and read about reuben and simeon and, and levi and go, yeah, those are bad guys, and he's telling them they're bad guys, and this is what's going to happen because they were bad guys. And then we get to Judah, and we have the praise and all this, and all of a sudden we have references that the line of the tribe of Judah and so forth, and we're pretty sure this is talking about Jesus, and then we can go right back to the other brothers and, and think that 
Well, their references don't have anything to do with the last days, but all of them do. And, uh, uh, and that's what we're going to see. Kind of help make my point here. And again, throws you off a little bit if you have an NIV or New American Standard because it won't use this very important phrase, the last days. Often translated in English, the latter days as well. It's the same word uh, in, in Hebrew. NIV, New American Standard, Standard, unfortunately uses the phrase like, and the days to come which doesn't really help us, you know. It's, it's almost like saying, uh, uh, and there's a grocery store down there if you can find it, as opposed to saying there's a Safeway right down there if you can find it. One, one helps you a lot more, uh, and, uh, and that's the idea here. Now, we do find that phrase in, its, uh, in uh, prophetic terms many times in the Old Testament, just to give you a few and uh, I have to tell you that just uh, warn you right up front, <laughs> it's pretty informational when we talk about prophecy and so forth. Uh, I'll, and I will allude to a lot of things that uh, uh, I'm not under the assumption that you're at home studying prophecy all week long and you're all set for this or anything. But uh, I can't go into a lot of details when I mention the tribulation, I mention the rapture of the church. These are things we have studied in depth before, but uh, a lot of those things come into play here. But uh, I'll do the best I can to kind of slow it down and keep us on track here. But the last days, where else do we find it? Well, one is in Numbers 24 where Balaam is prophesying about uh, the Messiah, about Jesus coming in the future. He uses this term in verse 14. And now indeed I'm going to, uh, I am going to my people. Come, I will advise you what this people will do to your people in the latter days. So it's going to happen in the future at the end of the times. I behold him but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel. You may have seen that on a few Christmas cards over the years, and we all know that it's a reference to, uh, to Jesus' coming. When is he coming? In the latter days. Uh, Isaiah 2, 2 says, Now shall come to pass in the latter days, our same word, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Uh, many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways. We will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. I would say we're not quite there yet as far as the uh, no war anymore. Why? Because it's in the latter days. It's going to be the end. This is really speaking about the very end when Jesus Christ comes back and establishes his kingdom. There will be wars uh, until that time. It's in the latter days. Ezekiel 38, referred to as the Magog invasion, uses that term as well. Again, this is the confederation of Iran and Russia uh, with uh, some other Islamic uh, nations in the Middle East that will lead an attack against Israel and they will be defeated. Two thirds of them will be destroyed, which basically removes Russia from being the major power in the world that they, uh, that they are now, which I believe sets the stage for the rise of, of the Antichrist in, uh, uh, in Europe, the revived Roman Empire. But uh, we have all these uh, alliances all set and in place. But Ezekiel says, you will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when, when I am hallowed in you, O God, before their eyes, the leader of Magog. It's going to happen in the latter days. <laughs> it seems like it's about ready to happen uh, any time. So again, we live in the last of those days. Daniel 9 uses the uh, phrase, excuse me, Daniel 2 uses the phrase, in describing the uh, image of Nebuchadnezzar, when he's kind of uh, telling his history in advance there and begins to describe the last days. Hosea, we went through this a few weeks ago on Wednesday night, Hosea 3, 5. Afterward, the children of Israel, Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. So again, all, so we just try to you know, make the point, obviously, so when we see Jacob saying, I'm about ready to say something. I'm going to predict or prophesy some things that are going to happen in the future. And it's going to happen in the latter days. 
Now, it's interesting as we read through it, and we'll point out as he gets to these sons, the things he says about them kind of happen in their, in their lifetime or with their generations. But we have to keep in mind, that's obviously not his main point. His main point is these things will happen at the very end, uh, in a sense, uh, in the days that we live in and the days that are still, uh, still ahead. Well, let's look at the firstborn son. We say the prospect of this firstborn son, Reuben, failed all expectations because certainly Jacob had great expectations, as uh, most fathers do when their first son uh, is born. Verse 3, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, the excellency of power. Sounds pretty good so far. Verse 4, unstable as water, you shall not excel. Why? Because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it, he went up to my couch. So the prospects sound very good at the beginning, and, uh, and certainly uh, Reuben had to live with the memory of his attempt to usurp his authority over his father's, uh, and that was the whole idea. Uh, he ends up going and again sleeping with his, uh, would be his, like his stepmother, uh, in order to try to usurp his authority over his father. Uh, in other words, I'm the number one. I'm taking over. This is all going to be mine. That's, that's really what it was all about. Uh, he begins good. He's my strength. The beginning, uh, he's my, uh, my might and beginning of my strength, excellency of dignity, excellency of power. Uh, but because of this great sin, he says he's unstable as water. You shall not excel. So we'd say, secondly, the prospects of the firstborn failed because of that sin, as described in verse 4. One writer said, this is one of the fiercest denunciations in all the book of Genesis. Jacob, in fact, may have been fearful of even saying this to Reuben up to this point. Now, we talked about the transformation of all these sons through Joseph and Joseph's faithfulness, faithfulness and how he kept from revealing himself to them to know what was really in their heart. The guy that really stands out, of course, is Judah. Uh, it certainly seems the others are going along with him uh, and have repented of this idea of selling Joseph into slavery and so forth. But um, obviously, Jacob has some pretty harsh words to say to Reuben here. Uh, so again, uh, how did this uh, prediction work out in Reuben's lifetime? Well, by the time the Reubenites, his descendants, again, after the slavery in Egypt for 400 years, under the leadership of Moses, then under the leadership of Joshua, and they go into the land, uh, what territory did, uh, did uh, well, what did Reuben get? Uh, well, they got a territory to live in, but uh, we don't hear much about them because it was the idea is you're unstable as water, you shall not excel. There is no prophet, no king, no judge. Uh, nobody of any leadership that ever comes from the tribe of Re Reuben. In fact, he lacks real, uh, real leadership. And, uh, and he seems to just go off the scene of history uh, in terms of the nation of Israel. In terms of, yeah, that's what happened to him, but how does it apply to the, the last days? Uh, well, the prophecy has a present day application based on what uh, he says to Reuben in the future, in the last days. Again, what was his sin? Immorality kind of gross, sexual, perverted immorality. Jacob says, in the latter days, there will be gross immorality going on. Certainly it continued to be a problem for Israel once they were in the land and they were in a backslidden condition. I would say it's a problem for us today. And the idea here is that if it goes unchecked, unconfessed, never repented of, then God says, I will judge the nation that does that. That's what he's saying to Reuben. Uh, this is going to happen to you. You did this. This is what you did. It was immoral because you did that. You're un unstable as water, and you will be judged. And certainly, this is very consistent with all of our other, uh, other studies in the Old Testament. We've often said, if God would judge his own people Israel, which he did, taking them into the Babylonian captivity and so forth, he certainly will judge other nations as well. And that should be a great concern for us. And that's why we continue to want to pray for our nation and, uh, and pray for uh, a revival for our nation that we turn back to God uh, and turn, turn back to the, the precepts of the Bible and want to live a life that's pleasing to him. Because Jacob says in the future, in the latter days that we live in now, God will judge nations who turn to this kind of immorality. 
So again, his last words are prophetic. The prospect of the firstborn son looked pretty good for a while, uh, but he failed all expectations. And that takes us to the punishment of Simeon and Levi. Uh, and it's based on their anger, verse 5. Simeon and Levi are brothers, instruments of cruelty, are in their dwelling place. Let not my soul enter their council. Let not my honor be united to their assembly. For in their anger they slew a, a man, it should be plural, men. And in their self-will they hamstrung an ox. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce. And their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. So again, the punishment uh, against Simeon and, uh, and Levi is based on, well, the killing of the men uh, of Shechem. You remember as uh, Jacob finally leaves uh, Uncle Laban, takes his whole entourage and heads back. He's got to deal with meeting brother Esau that he doesn't know is going to kill him or not. Uh, he uh, basically humbles himself there by the river of Javok, and he wrestles with God all night. God dislocates his hip. He's a humble man. He's going to trust God and not his own wise and scheming, trickery and so forth. Things are finally looking better for Jacob. Things have kind of turned a corner. God renames him Israel. And they head off and things go pretty well with Esau. Esau says, uh, well, follow me <laughs> back to my camp. And he says, okay, we're right behind you. And then he goes that way. <laughs> uh, he should have been going to uh, Bethel. Uh, that's where God met with him. He, uh, he slept that night on the stone pillow, saw the angels ascending, descending. God makes the promise, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to take you there. I'm going to bring you back. Come back here, the house of God, Bethel. That's not where he goes. He goes to a place called Shechem to put distance between him and Esau because he didn't trust God. He was trusting in his own flesh once again. And bad things ha happen there. They try to get along. He buys a little property. Uh, you know the story. Hamar, who's one of the princes, the son of the king uh, of the Shechemites, comes in and uh, he takes Dina or Dinah out on a little date, show her the town, and he ends up raping her. That uh, hit the brothers, Simeon and Levi, find out about that. Uh, they decide they're going to do something about it. You remember the whole story. They come up with this whole deceitful uh, way of disarming the men of the city. They say, yeah, well, you know, we can intermarry and we can all get along and that's no problem. You guys just all need to be circumcised because that's part of our faith and so forth. If you do that, then no problem, <laughs> which, which they go along with. Uh, and then while they were incapacitated, these two march into the city and slaughter every male uh, in the place. And as they come out with blood covering them, uh, Jacob says to them, what have you done to us? knowing that maybe the Amorites or others that are around, or maybe there's more Shechemites somewhere, they're going to hear about this, they're going to come and wipe us out. Uh, and it was a, a horrible scene, and they move on from there. Uh, that's what's being talked about when it says, you slaughtered uh, men. Simeon and Levi are brothers, instruments of cruelty in their dwelling place. Because of that, Secondly, the punishment prediction will be a division within Israel. Both tribes are divided. Both tribes are scattered. Uh, and none of them really get the inheritance they would have gotten otherwise. Uh, again, in their lifetime, in that day, is that what happened? Actually, it is. Simeon, by the time the Simeonites get into the land under Joshua, in Joshua 19, they're given the, the area of Beersheba, which is a desert wilderness. <laughs> it's not... Uh, Nobody would really want that. Uh, and it basically, it says they'll be scattered, and that's what happened. After a while, Judah just takes over that area, and the, the Simeonites just kind of dissipate or whatever. The Levites, of course, uh, because of their actions during one rebellion, uh, they uh, end up uh, becoming the priest, although God intended all 12 tribes and everybody to be priests. It ends up being only the Levites. Uh, and uh, as they do that, of course, they are not given land because God is their inheritance. So they, in a sense, are dissolved and disinherited and don't get a land, uh, actual land in, in that uh, sense either uh, in Joshua 13, 14. So that's the, what, what uh, Jacob says. That's what happened to them. Again, how does it apply? Uh, uh, and what is it talking about in the latter days? The present application. Well, what was their sin again? It was anger. Jacob says that, he prophesies that in the late, latter days, in the last days, there's going to be a real issue with people with tremendous anger. They slew uh, men. 
Uh, they were self-willed, it says. It said they hamstrung an ox, which uh, is how people earn their living. That's how they pulled the plow. It's how they earned a living. And for fun, or in a sense, just for a sense of cruelty, uh, they take that away. So in the latter days, there's going to be people that have incredible anger. And they're going to be cruel in their acts towards other people. Uh, and if it, uh, it is not repented of, uh, then God will judge them. And, uh, and there's some words of wisdom for us from, from Jacob. And I just want to say, if you haven't noticed, there's a lot of angry people out there. <laughs> and it seems like it's getting worse. Uh, you remember in the 1950s that term road rage? No, I don't think it was early around. Uh, but, you know, you just, all these things, these terms that are around today. Uh, <laughs> man, I've, I, I've noticed it just surfing. People duking it out in the water and stuff. I don't even go to those places anymore. People are just on edge. And uh, I can tell you from uh, coaching little kids in baseball for a, a number of years uh, that uh, there's a lot of angry young, young kids that are out there because they don't have dads. A lot of them come to the Lord. A lot of them get over it. A lot of them don't. And they're just angry about it. And they grow up that way. And they have a chip on their shoulder. Uh, and, it, and it comes out. Uh, and in, and in with no moral bearing giving to them, there's a window of opportunity in kids' life when you can teach them moral character, <laughs> which was done for a couple of thousand years, uh, and it's not done anymore. We certainly want, wouldn't want to inflict our cultural values on another person. My goodness, just let them grow up amorally. You know, kids will be kids. They'll grow up and they'll be fine. No, actually, they, they won't. All the research says allow the child to grow up on his own and it becomes something. It's called a criminal. And uh, that's the thing they have in common. That research costs a lot of money, by the way. Uh, but that was the, a, lot of, a lot of studies have, uh, have shown that. And, uh, and we live in those days. So here's the advice from Jacob. Notice in verse 6. Let not my soul enter their counsel. In other words, don't listen to the people that are angry, that have a chip on their shoulder. Uh, because uh, you may have to work with them. You may have one as a teacher. You may have to go to school with them. But you don't have to listen to their counsel. Yeah, I would just divorce her if I were you. You don't have to put up with that. That's an angry person talking that obviously has never been able to develop the maturity to have a relationship with someone of the opposite sex. And as a result, they want to expound their own philosophy on others. There's just a lot of anger. And it, uh, it is uh, ruining marriages, creating problems uh, in uh, our families uh, around the country. Jacob predicts it would be like that in the last days. And says, uh, don't enter their counsel. Then he says, let not my honor be united to their assembly. Uh, that is, uh, don't be around them. Don't hang out with them. Yeah, again, you may have to work with them, uh, but you don't have to hang out with them during your free time. Proverbs is full of warning about stay away from the hot-tempered man, the angry person. Proverbs 22, 24 says, do not make friends with a hot-tempered man. Do not associate with one easily angered. Or you may learn his ways and get yourself ensnared. So be careful who you associate with, who you hang out with. Uh, but again, may, you may be thinking, well, uh, I, don't, I don't like <laughs> hanging out with angry people anyway. So that's not much of an issue for me. Uh, you know, I try to stay away from at work and so forth. But also there's a way you can associate with them, I think, even through the media. In other words, I, I have some friends, family members... I can tell when they're listening to talk radio, certain guys, certain guys that are angry because their whole thing is if they can make you angry, because what's happening to this country every day? You know, and if you listen to them enough, you get angry just like them because you're associating with them sometimes for an hour or so every day. And there's some bad things happening out there. And there's some things that are really disgusting and displeasing. Uh, but we need to pray for, pray for our nation. And getting, becoming an angry person and joining in is not going to help anyone. And we need to be very, very careful. Uh, you can, you know, through the kinds of movies you watch and stuff, you're making associations. And uh, we need to be very careful. Do not make friends with a hot-tempered man. Do not associate with one easily angered. And uh, so these are all warnings. In the latter days, there's going to be a problem in an issue 
based on the sexual immorality committed by Reuben, there's going to be that kind of thing going on in the latter days, in the last days. Anger, and, uh, and the idea of anger associated with cruelty uh, is going to be uh, part of the, the last days. And uh, it doesn't take a real stretch of the imagination uh, to wonder how this is all coming about. It's just watching the ev evening news and just people killing people and people killing others and then killing themselves. And uh, there's just horrific things that are taking place in our own culture. So Jacob's last words are definitely prophetic. They're of the last days. Prospect of the first son looked pretty good, uh, but the warning there is against immorality and God's judgment of it. Then the punishment of Simeon and Le Levi can be applied to us. We need to be careful and accept the wisdom and the words of Jacob. Well, all right, now we get to Judah. Something good here. The praise and the predictions concerning Judah. Uh, and a couple of things maybe just to uh, keep in mind uh, right from the get-go. Judah certainly is his name. And, uh, and we're going to see that Jacob apparently heard about and recognized the incredible transformation that took place in his life. And, uh, and that was one of the really uh, stellar moments in uh, you know, the big reveal of Joseph and Judah and their conversation and everything. And, uh, and that was awesome. Jacob must have known that, seen that, so he's got some pretty good things to say about Judah, despite his sin and the terrible thing that he did as well. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that because he's talking about not just his son, he's really talking about the future, the latter days. Uh, the phrase Judah becomes eventually associ associated with Jewish. Uh, remember that uh, because of the divided kingdom, after the death of Solomon, uh, you have Jeroboam establishing the kingdom in the north, the ten tribes up there in that vicinity, two are in the south, Judah and Benjamin. Judah's the bigger, so it just becomes known as Judah. It becomes known as Israel or Ephraim in the north. But when they introduced calf worship and all these idols and, and uh, burning their infants in the fire and all the other things they were doing in the north, the righteous people of the ten tribes flew to the south. So now you have all 12 tribes, some of them dwelling in the south. Eventually, the Assyrians come in. We've been going through this in our study on Wednesday nights. Uh, the Assyrians come in, capture these guys, take them. Uh, and uh, what they would do is split up their families and cause them to reintegrate with other cultures that they've conquered. So they become inter intermixed, uh, intermixed together. Uh, and you end up with folks like the Samaritans that have a partial heritage to the Jews, but kind of not really. Uh, they kind of go away. Uh, then in the south, eventually, Nebuchadnezzar comes in, takes, and the, that captivity takes all 12 tribes. They ta are taken into Babylon at that point. Who are they known as? Judah. All 12 tribes are known as Judah. In the captivity, they become known as Jewish. And so that, so when we're talking, so keep that in mind as we're reading a prediction in the last days about Judah, it's about the Jewish people and the Messiah of the Jewish people. So that's uh, certainly uh, important to keep in mind. So let's look at verse 8. And there's some, uh, uh, some very interesting things said about Jesus, the Messiah, here. Judah, you are whom he whom your brother shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion, who shall rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver law between his feet, until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people, binding his donkey to the vine, and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes, his eyes are darker than wine, and his teeth whiter than milk. Now, you may not understand all of that, but one thing's for sure, he's pretty much not talking about his kid, Judah, standing there. I don't know what Judah was thinking when he heard this from his father, <laughs> but uh, unless he got it, this idea that he's, he's talking about, not about him so much personally, but about the latter days. The first thing, again, we just mentioned that 
Judah was absolutely transformed uh, by the grace of God. What was his sin? Well, it starts out as a compromise as we went through our study in that. He ends up hanging out with a Canaanite. I can't remember his name right offhand. Uh, but it was a total compromise. And one day, and he's compromising his faith because he's hanging out with this unbeliever. They decide to go to the uh, annual sheep shearing, which is basically a pagan festival. Uh, there's going to be a little drinking going on, some carousing and so forth. Uh, and, uh, and Judah heads off to do that with his Canaanite buddy. On the way, though, he sees what appears to be a Canaanite prostitute. So he decides he's going to uh, uh, engage her services, uh, and, uh, which he does. Uh, little does he know that that Canaanite prostitute really isn't a prostitute. It's his deceased son's wife. It's his daughter-in-law. And, uh, and so and why she does this is a whole other story. But uh, she gets pregnant. Uh, in the end, because it's discovered that she is pregnant, then Judah says, well, let's burn her at the stake. And then she reveals the fact that he actually is the father. You remember the story. She's got his seal and his staff to prove it. Uh, and as a result, then he says, she is more righteous than I. And it's certainly a turning point in the life of Judah. But the rest of it comes into play in terms of Joseph and Joseph's interaction with him. Uh, and they're going down to Egypt because of the famine and so forth. But he's incomplete. He commits this terrible sin. Uh, but he's completely transformed as he stands before Joseph. He doesn't know who he is. He's just the viceroy, the prime minister, held the life and death in his hands. And he said, please take my life instead of taking Benjamin. Because he's a person that understood the idea of substitutionary death. Because his grandfather, Isaac, would have told him all about it. About an episode where he went up on Mount Moriah with his father, Abraham. And his life was spared because God provided a substitute for him. He understands the idea. And, uh, and in a Christ-like move, Judah says, take my life. Let me be the substitute. Let him go free. Uh, I may have not liked how I was treated by my father. I may have not liked that he was preferred over me. But at this point, I don't care. I love my father. My father loves this kid. That's enough for me. Take me. Incredible transformation. And so he's praised. Uh, but uh, again, this is really a prediction of the Messiah who is from the tribe of Judah, who is the lion of the tribe of Judah. So that gets us to our second part here. The lion of Judah is predicted to be the Messiah. And there's seven aspects of it. And again, as we start reading this, you get, okay, it's about the Messiah. I get it. Jesus says, I'm the lion of the tribe of Judah in Revelation 5. And... Uh, uh, what, what does the rest of this mean, though? Because it's a prediction about the Messiah. It's not about Judah, the kid standing there. Not a kid. He's a grown man. But he's standing there. Uh, so what does it say to us about the coming Messiah? Well, the first thing is he's going to be praised. Look at verse 8. Judah, you are, are he whom your brothers shall praise, and your father's children shall bow down before you. One day... All Israel will praise Jesus as the Messiah, Jacob says. When is it going to happen? In the latter days. The latter days again began at Jesus' ascension, and they will end when he returns. And when he returns, remember, he's going to, we'll read more about it in a moment, he's going to rescue the remnant of Jews that God has supernaturally protected out in uh, present-day Jordan. We'll read more about that in a moment, uh, but they will... He will come back because they will all praise him uh, and accept him as the Messiah. One day it will happen. Uh, Jesus will be praised by all of Israel. And of course, that's what uh, the Apostle Paul says uh, in Romans 11, that all Israel uh, will be saved one day. He's to be praised. The second thing about the Messiah, he speaks of his preeminence over his enemies. Look at verse 8. Your hand shall be on the neck uh, of your enemies. And... Uh, and therefore, the, the Messiah will come one day. He came as a suffering servant of Isaiah 53, who died on the, sin, on the cross for our sins. He will come again as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the conquering king. And, uh, and he will have preeminence. He'll have great victory uh, over his enemies. That's the idea of, you know, on their, on their necks. There's, uh, I was just reading the story about uh, Joshua, conquest of the land. 
And uh, he's, he goes in the land. You remember the story of Jericho and the story of Ai, and they eventually have a victory over them. Uh, and because of that, there's a confederation of five kings that join together to go out against them. Uh, God gives them a good battle plan. They're trusting the Lord. And they have these guys uh, routed, and they're on the run. They catch the five kings, and they run into a cave. Joshua tells them, throw some boulders over it, trap them in there, and we'll continue to pursue the enemy uh, until we wipe them out. They do that. They come back to the cave, and Joshua says, take the boulders down and bring those guys out. And then he, he has them all pinned on their face on the ground, and he has all of his captains, all of his generals, brings all of his military leaders over, and he says, now... These mighty kings, these powerful kings, each of you go over there and take your foot and put it right on the back of their neck and stand there for a minute and do it on all five, all of them. He says, that's what God will do for us. These guys look mighty. How do they look to you now if we trust the Lord? It's kind of a, maybe it's kind of a guy thing or something, but it's kind of a radical thing, but, uh, but that's the idea, stepping on the, the neck of their enemies. It means preeminence. It means victory. It means conquest. And, uh, and Jacob says, in the latter days, the Messiah is going to come. Now, obviously, we have a lot more prophecy filling this all in, but this is pretty early on uh, in terms of uh, about the Messiah. Uh, one day he will come and be the conquering king. Third, there's a picture of the Messiah as the lion. He's, uh, he's the lion that's able in verse 9 to go out and get the prey and stand over it and be victorious. Who shall rouse him because of his courage and strength and uh, and so forth. And again, this becomes known uh, as, uh, as Jesus. Jesus becomes known as the, uh, Revelation 5 again as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. One day he will come back and have preeminence and dominance over his enemies. He will come like a lion as the tribe of Judah. And then the place of the Messiah as ruler. And this gets very interesting, <laughs> at least to me. I hope it is to you. Verse 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver uh, from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of, of the people. And I, I kind of want to give you two views on it. And uh, the first, uh, you know, the one that I've, uh, I've taught, I went back and did a little re more research. I could kind of grab the quota I needed for this and everything. But uh, what is it saying? Uh, one view, of course, here is that um, Shiloh is just another name for the Messiah, Okay. And, uh, and, and there's, there's kind of lots of discussion on that, but uh, uh, that's pretty agreeable to most rabbis is that it's just another term for the Messiah. So in other words, for Judah, the Judas, Jewish people, they will be able to retain the right to govern themselves. The scepter, you know, the king holds the scepter, the lawgiver uh, between his feet. They'll be able to rule themselves and govern themselves until the Messiah comes. Now that's, that's, that's the, the idea here. Uh, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver between his feet until Shiloh or, or the Messiah comes. And certainly the Jewish people have lost that and gained it several times. We've talked about the Babylonian captivity. They sure lost it then. Uh, but of course, uh, the promises from Jeremiah... Uh, were that, uh, you know, but it's not over. You know, God's going to bring you back in the land. It's going to be a 70-year uh, captivity, and that's exactly what happened under Cyrus, <laughs> predicted by name by Isaiah, the guy's name that would set them free. Uh, they go back into the land. They are able to govern themselves again. Then what happens, period of time goes on, and the Greeks uh, invade. Uh, and they lost that right to rule again, but they fight back under the, uh, the Maccabees. I understand there's a movie being made about that now. They fight back under the Maccabees and regain and then cleanse the, the temple. And cleansing the temple is the reason we uh, celebrate the Feast of Lights or the Feast of, of Hanukkah. And uh, because they cleanse the temple after they got the Greeks out, they regain it again. But then the Romans come. The Romans take over. And initially, the Romans basically conquered them. They took over them, and they said, <clears throat> listen, just pay your taxes and be quiet, and you can kind of govern yourselves and do the Mosaic Law thing that you're doing, you know, and, uh, which included capital punishment. How did the Jews perform capital punishment? It was by stoning, right? Of course, we know they lost that because by the time Jesus comes along and they want to execute him, they have to go to Pontius Pilate and get permission and he has to be, again, nailed to a cross and not stoned. So they lost the ability 
They lost the ability to govern themselves, to carry out capital punishment. So when did they lose it, and did the Messiah come? Well, around 6 or 7 AD, Herod Archelaus was dethroned, and the first Roman procurator took over. He was from Chicago, and his name was Al Caponius. <laughs> Actually, his name is Caponius, but that's just the way I try to remember his name. I don't know if that'll be helpful to you on the test, but... Uh, uh, Anyway, Caponius uh, takes over, 6 or 7 A.D. Sometime during his, his reign, though, there's, there's another rebellion, and there might have been many, and it was a real problem. Nobody, uh, no Roman official or military leader wanted to go to Israel at that time uh, to try to oversee this group of people because there was constant rebellions. And after one of those, he finally said, that's, that's it. We are completely ruling you at this point. You no longer have the ability to carry out capital punishment, and a lot of other things are taken away from them. And, uh, and this is what uh, Rabbi Rachman wrote during that time. This is from uh, Mark, Dr. Mark Eastman's book, uh, The Search for the Messiah. Uh, this rabbi wrote what happened uh, when this occurred. He said, quote, When the members of the Sanhedrin found themselves deprived of their right over life and death, a general consternation took possession of them. They covered their heads with ashes and their bodies with sackcloth, exclaiming, Woe unto us, for the scepter has departed from Judah and the Messiah has not come. I think, they, they, I think this was their view <laughs> Of, uh, of Genesis 49, 11, that they would have the right to rule and then you know, the Messiah would come, Shiloh would come. But uh, they lost it and they thought, this is it. We may never get it back again. And the Messiah has not come. He did come though, and he was a 12 year old boy. And I think that's why that passage is, is in Luke. You know the story, Jesus would have been taken uh, just as Joseph would go three times a year to Jerusalem for the annual feast. And uh, it's uh, my personal belief that he's, uh, he's bar mitzvah at this time at 12 because when they can't find him, he's in the court of the men discussing with the elders uh, the law and so forth, which he would not have been able to go in until he had become a son of the law. And, uh, and he's in there and they come find him. So he did come and this was fulfilled, but they missed it. They didn't see him as a 12-year-old boy coming. Of course, they missed the fulfillment of all the other prophecies. Now, the other idea is certainly true in the bigger picture is that uh, when the Messiah comes, he will have a scepter, and he will be the lawgiver, and he will be able to rule, and it will be during the millennial kingdom. And that's the other view that you might hear uh, sometimes uh, as well. I think both of them are obviously true. I think Jesus was there. He comes on the scene before they lose the ability uh, to rule themselves in that sense and carrying out capital punishment in particular, uh, but also certainly Jesus will rule and reign with a scepter. Isaiah tells us it will be a, a, uh, a uh, scepter or a rod of iron. We sometimes uh, look at that and go, man, that sounds harsh. Yeah, it is. He, he kind of makes everybody obey, <laughs> which is, makes for a, a very civil society. And, uh, 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 and that's what it will be during the Messianic reign. Uh, ideas of the Messiah uh, doing this, ruling this way. A couple of references. Psalm 67, uh, Gilead is mine. Manasseh is mine. Ephraim also is the helmet for my head. Judah uh, is my lawgiver. And uh, Psalm 108 says almost exactly the same thing. Isaiah 33, 22. Uh, the Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. Certainly Jesus will be the lawgiver and he will be the king. But I think he did also come and fulfill this prophecy by Jacob. The fifth thing Jacob says about the Messiah is in reference to Palm Sunday, the Palm Sunday entrance. Notice the reference to the donkey and the colt, verse 11, binding his donkey to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. And we don't have a whole lot of information there, but Jacob says there's something about the Messiah coming and when he comes, it's going to have something to do with a donkey and a colt. And of course, we'd go many years before the prophet Zechariah, Zechariah 9, 9 comes along and says, when the Messiah comes, he will come lowly and riding on a donkey, even the foal of a donkey. Uh, and of course, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on what we refer to as Palm Sunday, because of the branches they put before him, 
It was uh, on those first days of Passover. And you remember, just days before that, he had raised Lazarus from the dead. That had caused this huge stir. His whole entourage had come with him from Galilee, from the north. But now everybody in that city has heard about he has the power over life and death. They were already suspecting that he was the Messiah. He is absolutely the Messiah. And when he rides into the city, they're all saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, what's interesting about that is that during Passover, all of the priests are there in Jerusalem. Not some of them, but every course of priests were there. And uh, they have a little music festival going on. Big time choir, you could hear it all over the city. No amplification, but you could hear, you could hear the music for miles. They've got the, the trumpets blown and the whole thing. And they're singing the Hallel Psalms. One of those Hallel Psalms is Psalm 118 uh, that goes like this beginning in verse two. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, and he has given us life. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God. I will exalt you. I'm pretty sure that's talking about Jesus. And, uh, and so here they... <laughs> They're singing this loudly. Uh, and Jesus is coming to the city and the people are saying it and saying Jesus is the fulfillment of it and Jacob predicted it. Uh, pretty, pretty cool, pretty amazing. Number six, the promise of the coming Messiah's wrath. We see that in verse 11. I don't know what Judah was thinking about when Jacob said this. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. So when the Messiah comes, and again, coming the first time on Palm Sunday, humble and lowly, riding on a donkey, the foal of a colt, but he comes a second time in wrath. Uh, and it's so bad that his garments look like they're covered in blood. Certainly that's the implication. If that's all we had, it'd be like, wow, that's kind of very interesting. But that's not all we have, because Isaiah the prophet comes along later, uh, and says this, and uh, I, Isaiah 63, and it begins, who is this who comes from Edom, from Basra? And again, Basra is not the Basra in Iraq. It's the Basra that's in present-day Jordan, or what we refer to as the rock city of Petra. And uh, if, if we didn't have anything else, we'd be kind of like, wow, what does that mean? But we have Daniel chapter 9. We have the whole book of Revelation to know that when Jesus returns, when the remnant of Jews that are over there are being protected from the forces of the Antichrist, supernaturally by God, Jesus returns in Revelation 19 with us, his saints. We're going to find out from this passage, we ain't really doing anything, but we return with him. He's doing everything. Uh, and he destroys the forces of the Antichrist with the breath of his mouth. And then he goes to Basra, according to this passage in Isaiah, to rescue that remnant uh, of Jewish people there who have cried out and mourned for one who mourns for an only child. Uh, and we found out from our study in uh, Hosea a couple of weeks ago, very interesting, that, that three days prior to Jesus' return, they're going to start crying out to him and realize what's going on. And they will worship like they worshiped when they came out of the slavery of Egypt. It was kind of a cool little tidbit uh, buried there uh, in our Hosea study. But this is what Isaiah says. Here's our tie-in with Jacob's prophecy. Who is this who comes from Edom with dyed garments from Basra, the one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength? I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red? Here's the question. Why, why is this happening? Why in your garments like... Uh, one who treads in the wine press. I have trodden the wine press alone, and from the peoples no one was with me, for I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all my robes. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. Glory, glory, hallelujah. That's where the song comes from. The graves of wrath are marching out. That's where that song comes from. Uh, I don't know the rest of it, or I probably shouldn't keep going anyway. But you get the idea. I just want to make sure you're still awake here with me. But, uh, yeah, this is an amazing uh, prophecy by Jacob saying that when the Messiah comes, there's an association with the donkey. There's also an association with wrath. 
And of course, there's no way that they could have figured that out until the other prophecies come along. Uh, but we live on the other side of the cross to know of Jesus coming the first time. And we also recognize that he will come uh, a second time. Uh, and when he does, uh, his wrath will be against uh, a Christ-rejecting world. He will save that uh, remnant of Jewish people, fulfilling what Paul said would happen. In the end, all Israel would be saved. Not every Jewish person, but every Jewish person that's part of that remnant that's cried out and recognized Jesus as the Messiah. Seventh, and finally, the position that the Messiah will have as judge, that's in verse 12, his eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. So again, verse 12, we see the, the aftermath of his uh, return of judgment where he is judging. That's the idea of his, his, are, his eyes are darker than wine. He can see and he knows and he's able to judge. And he judges in righteousness. His teeth are whiter than milk. It's a picture of strength and it's a picture in power. And we know that, uh, uh, that Jesus will do that. He returns. And again, he's marching from Basra across the plains of Jordan where he arrives on the Mount of Olives. Goes to the top of the Mount of Olives, overlooks the city, and the Mount of Olives splits in two. By the way, all of those that conquered Jerusalem in the past, in a sense, that's what they did. They either went up to Mount Scopus, over to Mount Olives, and they stood over it. They raised their javelin because they had conquered Jerusalem. Didn't split in two with them, <laughs> but there's going to be a radical geological change. Uh, the Mount of Olives will split in two. Now, Jesus, when he's talking about this in Matthew 25, Matthew 24, signs of the end of the age. Matthew 25 he talks about the aftermath. It says there'll be a judgment of the lambs and the goats. Daniel and Daniel 9, or by the time you get past Daniel 9, about 10 or so, he begins to talk about this aftermath in a period of 45 days where Jesus will be judging the nations of the world. And how will he judge them? He'll judge them whether they were Semitic or anti-Semitic. During the tribulation period, how did nations, how did people treat the Jewish people who are being uh, unmercifully persecuted? The Antichrist is trying to exterminate every one of them uh, if he possibly can. And Jesus will judge nations on whether they were Semitic or pro, uh, pro-Semitic or anti-Semitic. And, uh, and right now, if he had to do that today, <laughs> they, there's, I think only one nation is going to make it. Which nation would that be? That would be Canada. That would be Canada. Canada is the only nation that's really standing with the nation of Israel today. Harper, their prime minister, is an evangelical Christian who has uh, taken a tremendous stand in partnership with Israel. And this week, as he anticipates and wants to support the needed strike against Iran and their nuclear facilities, he closed down the embassy uh, in Iran, pulled all of his people out, and kicked every Iranian diplomat out of the country of, of Canada because he believes it's going to happen. It's a little thing he can do to show his support for Netanyahu and their, and their government there. There was a little open mic about a year ago that wasn't supposed to be open at one of the G8 summits. We've mentioned it before, but... Again, there was, uh, they were there and uh, in that G8 summit, they were trying to discuss what to do with the problem of Israel and, uh, and how they can bring Israel under control so they won't create such problems for the rest of the world and its economy and so forth. And Harper, who was in power at that time, uh, went to our president, Barack Obama, and said to him, they didn't know the mic was on, said to him, I'm paraphrasing, Barack You'd better go back home and read your Bible and find out what the Bible says about God's people, the Jews. And then basically when it says, we need to stand with them. This is our day to support them and not turn our backs on them. And those are the days that we're, we're living in. There's a lot that came out this week out of the Middle East of the press in Israel. They certainly were very concerned uh, about what took place earlier in the Democratic uh, National Convention and their platform basically uh, throwing Israel under the bus, saying that they no longer recognize Jerusalem to be the, uh, uh, the capital of Israel. By the way, it is. That's where the Knesset is. That's where their office is. It's been their capital for a long time. They have trouble getting other nations to recognize their own capital. Uh, why? Uh, because they're more pro-Palestinian, uh, and they want to see a divided city uh, if there's ever a peace accord between the Palestinians and, and the nation of Israel. But... Uh, 
There's a lot going on right now in regards to Israel. We're just hoping that the United States will stand with them. But they believe we will not stand with them on an attack against Iran. And they do not believe uh, they can wait for us to do uh, anything about that. We'll certainly be uh, in our prayers for them. But Jesus will judge at the end of the tribulation period. Uh, his eyes are darker than wine. He sees everything, knows everything. He'll make all of the right judgments, but it'll be predicated on nations, how they treated Israel or how they were against uh, Israel. Jacob's a pretty good prophet, isn't he? <laughs> the last days. Uh, again, the occasion is blessing his sons, uh, but he kind of narrows down the predictions of who the Messiah is. Genesis 3.15, he's going to come from the seed of the woman. Uh, then he's going to come through <coughs> righteous Noah and his family that makes it on the ark. Then Noah says, in a similar kind of situation, blessing his sons, predicts that the Messiah will come through the descendants of Shem. And then God narrows it down to one of his descendants, a guy named Abram, uh, and changes his name to Abraham or Abraham. And then Abraham passes on that promise to his son Isaac. He passes that promise on to his son Jacob. And we would have anticipated Jacob passing the promise on to Joseph, but he doesn't. It's going to come through Judah. And then Samuel the prophet later narrows it down and says, through Judah, but through the family of David. Messiah's got to be a Davidic king. So things get narrowed down, and of course, Jesus fulfills all these things, born in the land of Judah, uh, in the city of Bethlehem, uh, in the lineage of King David. Jesus had all the, all the credentials. But we, we, we live in a time when there's a lot of people that don't know that he came. <laughs> and some of them may be like those rabbis in the streets thinking we missed him, or others thinking he's not coming at all, or some say he's still coming in the future. But uh, we have prophecy to tell us that he has come before and he's going to come again. Next time is the line of the tribe of Judah.